Well, good morning. Was that me? That's, it's the spirit talking. If there's loud noises like that, take it as God speaking something to you, sort of reprimanding. Um, looking back, I uh, I spent about eight, no, about ten years working with with middle and high school students, and um, one of the one of the things you learn if you've done that, or you just have as parents, middle or high school students, which I don't yet, um, is that they have this sense to which they believe that they are 100% invincible in every way, right? Like they live their lives as if nothing can touch them, as if they are this fortress, both in terms of physical well-being and, and emotional, they just kind of do life expecting that nothing really will happen to them. And so part of growing up Somewhere between then and the college years, at the very least, when you get to the, the 30s where I'm at, you start to learn between then and now that that's hogwash and that the world can be really tough and in a lot of ways unfair and that you are very much vulnerable as a human being, right? Especially if you start to get older, I'm at, I'm at like the cusp. I'm just starting. And if you're like in your 60s or 70s, you'll, you'll shake your head at me. But like, I'm at the cusp of where like health things are like, you know, I don't feel like as great as I did when I was 25, you know. Like, I'm far from, I'm far from complaining, but I'm like, I'm just at like the, the starting point of, of that. Like, oh, this is just the way I'm going to feel now. Wow. Right? You learn. Your bodies aren't invincible, but in that age group, you, you kind of think that they are. That's just how you feel. Nothing can touch you. You can't be hurt. And, and we know that we are physically all but invincible, but rather we are very vulnerable. Right? We learn caution when we grow up. We have this, this level of understanding that stuff can hit us. Uh, but what happens when we function with a level of invincibility on a spiritual level? Right? Because while we might be in our 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and think, you know, I, I've learned that I'm, I'm not an invincible person. Life can hit me pretty hard, and, and things can happen, and actions have consequences and all those things. I think a lot of times, one of the last places we learn that lesson is in a spiritual sense, right? We, we tend to think that we are spiritually invincible, and, and, and that becomes problematic. It, it can happen really easily to us. We just get comfortable in our church life and in our faith life, and we think, you know, nothing can touch me. I, I prayed the prayer when I was in third grade. Everything's good, and we kind of go on with our lives expecting to just have the Lord miraculously grow and shape us so that you know, because we prayed that prayer in third grade, when we die, whatever we've done, it, it's fine, it'll be okay. And we just kind of feel this invincibility in a way. And that happens really easily. And it's the theme of the church and the city that the church is located in the letter that we're looking at today. We, we've been looking at the, the seven letters to the seven churches in Revelation uh, 1 through 3, right? It's the, it's the part of Revelation that still makes sense before things get super wonky. Um, if you finish this series and you think to yourself, hey, I might really want to dive into the, the, the little more wonky stuff. Uh, this fall, the, the men are on Tuesday nights are starting a Bible study. Um, Ralph, as brave as a soul as they come, has decided to actually tackle the book of Revelation. And so um, how that goes, I'll leave up, up to them. But it, it, it's, it's a tough book to study. But we're going to spend time for the, just the next few weeks still in the letters themselves, which are pre all of the kind of... Things go a little wonky, right? And so today we're looking at the church in Sardis. Uh, it's the fifth of the seven churches. Um, if you remember the, the chiastic structure, it's the third of the like progressively bad to worse churches, right? And we have the, the first and the last church are kind of like they're doing stuff, but they shouldn't be doing this. The second and the second to last church don't have any reprimand. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. God just kind of encourages them. And then in the middle, the three churches, you know, three, four, and five, are progressively worse at what they're supposed to be doing. And the Lord's letters to them get progressively more direct and mean. And today we're hitting the crux of that. And so if you came today with a lack of sleep and a little sad, I'm really sorry. Um, this might not help you out all that much. But we're going to take a look at that, at that letter this morning. So I would invite you to stand with me and read in Revelation 3, uh, verses 1 through 6 from God's word this morning. Let's stand together and hear the word of God. Revelation 3, verses 1 through 6. And to the angel at the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. 
You have the reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments. And they will walk with me in the white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's the word of the Lord. Hey, and it's moving. Great. Have a seat. So here's Sardis. Uh, it's a, it's a, a rendering. This isn't obviously what it still looks like today. Um, Sardis today, if you went, it's a pile of rubble that is probably the size of this sanctuary. Is all that's left of the city of Sardis. But at the time, Sardis was a, a majestic, significant city. It wasn't so much significant to the Roman Empire in the time that the letter is received, but Sardis was known throughout the ages as a city of great wealth. It was a, a place that was rich in deposits of gold and silver. It's believed that Sardis was the first ever place on earth that minted gold or silver into coins and used them as currency. So the idea of the coin originated in Sardis, obviously well before the Roman Empire. But that's one of the, one of the thoughts, is that because of the sheer amount that was there, that they were one of the first to start minting and using as currency. Sardis was a, was a leader in a lot of different practices, like dyeing of fabric and clothes and those kinds of things. Uh, they, they were a, a well-to-do, rich city in the middle of Asia Minor. And, and over the years, became known as this fortress that was impenetrable, right? You see that it was built with a wall. What you can't see is that what you're looking at isn't really the main part of the city. The main part is at the very top of the mountain, at the Acropolis. That was kind of the center, and it was almost impossible to conquer because these walls were so massive, and to get even near them, you had to get up the mountain, and it was just a place that you weren't going to break into. But yet, people did. What happened in Sardis is that Sardis got full of themselves. There's areas of the walls that were so impossible to get in that they didn't even bother to guard them. They let their guard down and they focused them on other places. And so two, two times significantly in the history of Sardis, there was a conquering that occurred that took the, the city by unbelievable surprise. The first was in 549 BC. It was the Persians, uh, Cyrus, uh, an, an army man of the army of Cyrus, climbed one of the impenetrable areas slowly, and he could take his time because no one was guarding anywhere near there. And once he got up, he got others up, and they slowly got soldier after soldier into the city until they just out of nowhere came and took over, and no one knew they even had gotten into and breached the walls. Right? The second time was around 195 BC. This time it was the Greeks. It was Antiochus. In the same way, they climbed over an area they weren't supposed to get in, and they went and they opened the gates to their army, and the army stormed the city and took it over. It was such a surprise whenever these conquerings, these takeovers would happen the two times that when the news of it hit throughout Asia Minor, no one really believed that it was true. They thought that people were lying, right? Because Sardis can't be broken into. It's kind of like the Titanic was unsinkable, right? Until it wasn't, right? So when the city fell, it would create shock and awe, but Sardis was this majestic place. And the problem with the conquerings is that they were easily avoidable if Sardis hadn't gotten full of themselves and decided to let their guard down, right? Now, Jesus... He doesn't employ the usual compliment sandwich that we're used to, right? Usually the letters come and, you know, you're doing great at this. You're steadfast. You're persevering with persecution. You, you, you love people well, but I have these kind of small things against you. Sardis doesn't go that way, right? It just starts right off the bat. Hey, it looks like you're alive, but you're dead. Right? And he introduces himself as the, the, the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. If you remember, every single introduction in every single of the seven letters 
is a piece. He uses a part of the description of Jesus that's in Revelation 1, right? And it's a part that applies kind of more directly to this church. So for the Sardis church, Jesus says, I, hi, I'm Jesus, the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars. Well, what does it mean to have the seven spirits and the seven stars? For the seven spirits, the best place we could go to find some kind of solace of an answer is in the book of Isaiah. In, in chapter 10, um, he's talking about, the, it's the prediction of the, you know, it should shoot forth from the stump of Jesse, and it says this in 11 verses 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This is Jesus. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, right? There's, there's one Holy Spirit in, in, in the theology that we hold. It's not like there's the Father, Son, and seven spirits. But there's many attributes of the Spirit. And so when Jesus says, he who has the seven spirits of God, what he's, what he's saying is, he who has, I'm coming at you, and I'm writing to you as one who has all of those attributes. All of them. I have that comes to you with the fullness of God's wisdom, of his understanding, of his counsel, of his might, of his knowledge, of his fear. And I hold the seven stars. Right? What Jesus is saying to them is, listen, he who's writing to you, I have the authority over everything. I'm the one who controls all of this. And here's all of the attributes of the spirit that I have. When I tell you this, I tell you this, not just as Jesus of Nazareth, but as the fullness of God's wisdom and understanding and counsel. You, you ought to really listen and take me seriously. And what does he say to them? I know your works. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Not you are dying. Turn the ship around. You are dead. Passive. Past. You have died. Right? Short of me resurrecting you, you're not coming back. It's too late for those things. Well, what can we do to make sure we stay alive? Nothing. You're already dead. You're done. Right? What a letter to get. Imagine if Jesus sent a letter to Stowe Presbyterian Church and said, Hey, I know your works. You look alive, but you're dead. Well, what do we do? Nothing. You're dead. Uh, okay. Right, and then he goes on. Well, there's, there's a very few select among you that, that will wear white robes that, that, that have continued to follow me. We probably start to bicker among ourselves. Like, well, who is it? Is it me? If you think it's you, it's probably not you, right? Like, <laughs> all those good things. It would create an unbelievable amount of tension. Just for a minute, let's take a step away from these letters and their details and understand what it would have felt like. Like, what happened in the history of of real history in a real church in a real place like Sardis as they received a letter addressed from God himself that told them they were dead. It would devastate a church. It would devastate us. I probably wouldn't come to work tomorrow. I probably wouldn't stay at work today. Right? Imagine receiving such a letter directly from the mouthpiece of God himself. Right? And here's the key. He doesn't just tell them they're dead. He says this, and this is the scary part. He says, you have a reputation for being alive, but yet you are dead. Right? So not only is the church in Sardis dead, they, they seem alive. The, the reputation of the Sardis church in the area surrounding, the churches around Sardis, maybe some of the churches that have been receiving these letters... Right? They saw Sardis as a church that was flourishing, that looked alive and well. By all perceptions, Sardis was doing great. Other churches probably envied them to a degree because of how wonderful they seemed to be doing. One of the things you'll notice is that we don't get a whole lot of the descriptions from all the other churches. What does every church have in common other than the two that don't get reprimanded? Right? One is you have idolatry, you have immorality, you're letting the culture come in and do all these things. He says it to every church except to this one. He doesn't actually say anything about those things to the church in Sardis. Right? Nothing. And so here's the reality. Chances are... We'll never know for sure, but based on some of the later stuff we see, chances are Sardis was a church that really didn't have a problem with the immorality of the other churches. 
They weren't allowing false teaching to come in. They probably were really proud of the biblically solid nature of their preaching and teaching and how on guard they were. And they probably were good at it. They probably had a great pastor who proclaimed scripture faithfully. They may well have not been involved in sexual immorality. They may well have stayed away from the sway of the culture around them. They may have had a bastion wall up where they said, no one gets to come in with the false stuff. We are going to be a church that's rock solid. And for all we know, they might have been. But yet God calls them dead. So we have to figure out, why? Why were they dead? We get a couple clues. First, I just mentioned, we don't actually have any faults listed like other churches. And so we can pursue and we can start to eliminate possibilities of what makes this church dead. And it's some of the rap sheet that the other ones have been getting. Right? Chances are they're not dead because they're letting the culture hold sway. Chances are they're not dead because they've lost their passion or even their love. Right? Why is it that they are dead when the other churches are simply struggling and need to turn the ship around? Well, in Sardis, you had a, a fairly massive Jewish population. Um, and, and the population of, of Jews in Sardis was large enough that they, they held a significant amount of actual sway, uh, not so much in the context of the whole Roman Empire, but within the city itself. It behooved the Roman Empire to, to let the Jews in Sardis live with a certain degree of freedom and laissez-faire. Right? Let's just let, let them kind of be them. And so the Jews in Sardis were able to get away with not participating in some of the cult practices that the Romans, Roman people would normally expect, right? If they didn't worship the gods of the Roman Empire, the people kind of turned a blind eye to that and kind of let them be them. Just let the Jews. So the Jews in Sardis actually enjoyed a fairly remarkable amount of freedom because of the amount of them there were. It's the same reason that Pilate, whenever the Jews want Jesus crucified and are so angry, so he kind of proceeds with caution because there were so many Jews that an uprising would have created issues. And so in order to appease the large quantity of Jewish people, they, they had more freedom in Sardis than in a lot of places. Probably not everywhere, but in a lot of places. To be considered a Jew or like a Jew in Sardis would have been a good thing. Probably the second best thing only to actually being fully engulfed into the Roman cult itself. Later, the second clue that we get is when Jesus is giving people the, the promises, right? Those who, those who stay, those who turn around, those who do what I'm supposed to do. He makes three promises. The first is white garments, right? The second is that he won't blot out their name in the book of life. And then the third is that he will confess their name before the Father, right? Jesus promises, I will confess your name before my Father when the time comes, and so we can assume, based on that promise, which is pretty unique to, to this letter, that one of the things that was probably happening is a lack of external confessing of the name of Jesus. What we see in that promise is taken directly, 100% out of Matthew 10. And it's the idea of, right, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father. Right? It's the same language. And so the implication of Jesus making this promise is probably that those who actually confess me as you're supposed to, I will confess your name when it comes time to stand before your maker after this life as you go to the next. But for those who don't, I won't. What does he say? Depart from me. I never knew you, right? And so the issue that we can surmise is probably the issue for the church in Sardis is that they are confessing they're not confessing Christ in the public square. That's probably it. There's really no better thought process to get us to what the church in Sardis was doing wrong, but, but that, was, that was probably it. They had this, this population, and the more that they could blend in with the Jews, it was almost kind of like they were Jewish light, right? Today they'd be Jews for Jesus, maybe. Um, but not, don't say the Jesus part out loud too much because it might get us in trouble. They just kind of hid in the shadow of the Jewish faith, and hope that they could fly under the radar and not deal with any of the fallout. And so Jesus tells them to wake up. And a better translation than wake up would be to be watchful. He said, listen, you're dead. 
You don't confess me, you're dead. Be watchful. And he tells them that if they're not watchful, he will come to those who don't repent like a thief in the night. Not, to your, not confronting in the middle of the day, but he'll come and he'll steal, steal eternal life away right in the middle of the night like a thief. Right? And you'll never know the day or the hour that he'll come. Right? This is terrifying stuff. For those in Sardis who do not confess the name of Christ in the face of what might come, he will come like a thief in the night steal their inheritance and you'll never know when it is could be now, could be tomorrow could be ten years from now Could be, but, but he promises that he'll come and that's what he'll do and I don't know about you but to me that is terrifying absolutely terrifying and so he says to them those who, the little that remains of you that hasn't completely died off yet the little, the little speck of what's left man, grow that and work on that and process that and get, get back on track with that, right? There's, there's two major ways that, that I see this letter hitting us as the church today. There's a, a, a bad way, a, a very discouraging, unhappy, unpleasant way that it hits us, and then there's an encouraging and a good and a pleasant way that it hits us. And so I'll do the opposite of a compliment sandwich. I'll start with the bad and get it out of the way, and then I'll end with a little shred of hope for us before we leave here so that we're not all crying when we go to the baby shower, okay? <laughs> the first, the first is, is the harsh way. Just as the church in Sardis likely did, we often struggle with public confession of Christ as Lord in the world in which we live. We love to have church and ministry here. We do. Right? And we, we even love to be on mission and, and when I say mission, we like to go and help people. We love dropping things off at Akron Pregnancy Center. And we'll talk about Jesus there because it's safe, because they appreciate us talking about Jesus because we're bringing them stuff and they love Jesus too. And right, So we partner with local Christian missions and missionaries that all share the same thing. And when the missionaries come here, we speak about the boldness of the gospel going forth. But here's, here's the truth. Most of us hesitate to actually throw the gospel out into the public sphere in which we're in. Be honest with you, and this isn't going to apply to every one of you, but at least one of these probably hits home. How many of you hesitate to pray for dinner out in public at a restaurant? Or if you're in a group of people where some are Christian and some aren't, you just eat because it's awkward to, to pray before your meal. Because that would be, I don't know, it might make them uncomfortable or whatever, right? How, how many, don't raise your hand, by the way. But how many, right? How many of you love Christian radio and you blast it in your car, but man, if you come to a red light and it's summer and your window's down, you might just turn it down a little bit because you don't want anybody to think you're a Jesus freak, right? And so, yeah, well, you, you, you turn it down and you blast. Kind of like you would turn down rap, like if, because <laughs> you don't want anybody to know that you listen to the bad language music, you know? But we, we, we do that. How many of you will post endless memes about Trump or Biden or any other political thing online because it's funny and it'll make you laugh? Or well, you'll post like a, a silly, funny Christian meme, but you'll be hesitant to really throw some, some gospel truth that could edify people out on your Facebook wall because you might get some backlash for that. How many of you would prefer that your coworkers didn't ask about your faith or you're terrified for the day that they do and what you might say and not say? How many of you would be terrified if I asked you to come up here right now and take a microphone and share your testimony of how Christ came into your life. Maybe you're scared of doing that in the body of people that believe as you do, let alone to, to ask you to maybe go do that in your workplace with a coworker. Right? Chances are at least one of those kind of things hits you and you go, yeah, that's intimidating. Many of you have done some of those things, and some of you might say, no, that's not scary at all. As a matter of fact, I get in trouble at work all the time, for sure. <laughs> Great, right? But each of us have kind of an ingrained hesitancy to proclaim the name of Christ outside of these walls in the spheres in which we're in, when it matters, when it counts, when there's people that need to hear the truth of the gospel. We tend to stay in our holy huddles and express our faith boldly among those who share our beliefs. And we make all kinds of excuses for it. I'm not eloquent. Well, if I say it, they'll think I'm a Bible thumper. 
You know, I'm worried they might not like me afterwards. And after all, I have to be winsome. Well, if you spend 30 years trying to be winsome, but you never get to the truth, well, what's the point of being winsome? <laughs> At some point, you just got to throw it out there, right? You can only spend so many years earning the right to speak into someone's heart. At some point, you have to use the right that you've earned. I'm not saying that you throw Bible bombs and lob grenades at people. I'm not saying that you have to like bring the hammer of, of the Holy Word down and bust out your, you know, your, your, your good old translation and start reading Scripture in their face. No, but we ought to be able to have conversations about the most significant part of our lives, the thing that brings us life, the thing that breathes life into us in the first place and sustains it and will sustain it forever. If you are a Christian, Jesus is the most important thing to you. If you brag about your spouse more than you brag about Jesus, you're doing it wrong. Not that your spouse isn't great, but they're not as cool as Jesus. I don't care who you're married to. My wife's pretty cool, but not as cool as Jesus. Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> but we ought to be that way. Most of us are so much more likely to share a movie or book that we just read than the gospel that we encounter in our lives every single day. And so the challenge to us is the same as the challenge to Sardis. We can have all the ministry we want. We can have all the love we want. We can guard our teaching. Your pastor can be perfectly theologically sound, which he probably isn't, but he tries to be. Right? You, you can have guards against false teaching. All your elders can do their jobs exactly as they're supposed to. Your deacons can do their jobs exactly as they're supposed to. You can have an involved membership. We could have 600 people show up to the, to the baby shower after this and bring so many supplies we'd have to rent a U-Haul truck to take them down. And all these things could be true of us. We could, have, we could have our children's ministry explode and have 100 children next week. But we could still have all those things and be dead if we don't proclaim the gospel, if we don't hold high the name of Jesus as a church and as individuals externally. This letter is addressed as much to you as a one person as it is to the whole of the church that we're sitting in today, as it was to the church at Sardis, as it is to the church down the street we need to be about the business of proclaiming. Now, here's the encouraging piece. I don't know about you. Maybe you don't play this game, but as a pastor, it's hard not to. I sometimes look at other churches in the area or in the country or in the world, and I go, man, those churches must be doing well. I wish we were doing that way. I went to GA uh, in, in Detroit, and it's Ward Presbyterian Church, a you know, massive couple thousand member church. And the first thing I noticed was the entrance to their children's ministry area looked like a scene straight out of Disneyland. There was like, like tube slides, like you had to take a slide to get into the kids' ministry area. It was, it was majestic. I'm like, man, it'd be cool if we had that, right? It, 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 we, we would be so much more thriving in our ministry. Or, you know, they have like 180 some staff on their staff at the church or something like that. It's, it's crazy how many people are on staff. Their tech department alone is like 13 people, right? That are full-time with benefits. I'm like, man, if we could, if we could have one. <laughs> I just want a guitar player so that I can sit down every once in a while in church. Right? And I go, man, it'd be good to have that. If we had that, might we, might, might we be a healthier, more vibrant church? But here's the truth. One of the things that this passage informs us of is that we have a misshapen idea of what it means to be as a church dead and alive. Right? There, is, there is a whole host of seven, eight, nine, ten thousand member megachurches in this country that are dead inside. You're going to go home today and you're going to put on Christian radio and you're going to hear their worship teams on, on the fish and other Christian radio stations. But guess what? Not all of them. I'm not saying if you're big, you're dead. That's not by any means it. There's some thriving, biblical, awesome, alive, large churches. But chances are, at least some of the ones you're going to hear on the radio on the way home, they are actually dead. They look alive, but they aren't. Those things that sometimes we strive for in the church world, in the Christian world, those are not the things that make us alive. They make us look alive. And if we are alive, they can help us live more powerfully and more loud out in the community and be more seen and all those things. They're great and they're helpful, but they are not what give us life. What gives us life is that we are a people after God's heart willing to proclaim him out into the world around us so that the gospel might go into every house in Stowe and the Falls and Talmadge and Akron and Twinsburg and Hudson 
and Macedonia and Fairlawn and, and all over the place where it isn't, in every place and town that we have reached, that every single company that is represented by the people that work in this room might have the gospel shared in it and might be revitalized by the truth of Christ. That is what is a sign of life. And the other stuff is byproduct. Right? And so we ought to be encouraged. You can have a church of 10 people more alive than a church of 10,000. 100% you can. Right? Those things aren't the things that ultimately matter. The only thing that matters is that we are a people that proclaim the gospel with fervor and with love to the world around us that desperately needs to hear it. And if someday we get to the point where there's a barista outside those doors serving us delicious free lattes, that's just a bonus. But it's not a sign of life. It's a byproduct. Let's strive for the thing that really, really matters so that someday when Christ comes like a thief in the night, he might look at us and say, there you go, welcome, remnant. You know what I've got for you? I've got a robe of white. I have your name written in the book of life. And I have my name, your name on my lips as I confess you to the Father as one of my children. Because you were faithful to confess me when it came time. You didn't shy away, and so neither now will I. Well done, good and faithful servant. If we don't do that, I don't care who we hire. I don't care how much talent is in this church. I don't care how vibrant we start to look. I don't care if we have to add on to this side of the sanctuary because we can't fit enough people. We won't be any more alive until that is at the core of who we are as God's people still Presbyterian church. Amen? Man, it's hard to do. The church in Sardis wasn't dead by accident. They had all the means, but they didn't do this because it's really hard. It's really, really, really hard to be in the midst of your sphere of influence outside the church and to proclaim Christ and worry about what happens if you do. That's a hard thing to do. No one here is saying you just ought to be able to do that like it's a piece of cake. We're not. It's a hard thing, but he calls us to it. And if your answer is, well, that's too hard, then Jesus' response was, well, you know, the cross was pretty hard. I went anyway for you. How are we going to respond to that? Right. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for hard truth. Thank you for reminders of what's important and what isn't. Lord, that we sometimes forget to focus on the things that truly matter, but you remind us through certain difficult passages like this what we're to be truly about. God, we pray that you would equip us to be about your business of sharing your gospel in your name. Lord, we pray that we might all find not just opportunities this week, but the boldness to lift you high in the world around us, in our spheres of influence. Darn the consequences. Because we know that in the end, no matter what this world does to us, no matter how much it harshly criticizes us, no matter how much it chews us up and spits us out, in the end, we will stand before you and we will be dressed in garments of white with our name in the book of life as one of your own, your beloved, that you care for and love deeply. And that you will confess our name before the Father, that as judgment comes, you will say, he or she is a faithful one of mine. We pray that you might get us there and help us. We love you and we praise you. And all his people said, Amen.